All right, guys. So welcome to the last class of the ICPY uh, ICPY 102. Okay, and uh, I have decided that I don't think I'm gonna push the material too far beyond the capacitor and capacitance calculation because, as you can see here, uh, in the first page of the last handout, that we have like uh, still a a few topics to cover, but I don't think that's kind of makes sense. Oh, hello. <laughs> Just show up. Thank you for showing up. <laughs> All right. You are the only one right now. <laughs> All right. But anyway, so uh, what I'm trying to say is I am going to uh, talk about just only this topics alone, which is sort of like it's a good thing. It's just like you, a closing or extend the concepts of the capacitance when you have something else uh, in the environment which coincide with the experience that we dis described or explained last time that's like when you have your fingertips around your touch screen and then it can detect the change of the capacitance on and on. So this is the scenario that will lead you to understanding of why the environment has some impact on the capacitance that's in the way. So that's what we are trying to cover today. And that's it. I'm going to say it's done. And it's not a lot. And the good thing about this one is the final result, it's going to be super easy. That's what we like. Okay. Okay. All right. And you will see that um, even though you have to listen to my explanation a little bit, but after that, the conclusion at the end is like there's no more calculus left. All right, so I think this is a good place to stop the 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 material and end the course. I think that's kind of nice. It kind of is like cool down and not like uh uh ends everything at the high note here. <laughs> All right, guys. So let's dive into it. All right. So welcome. <laughs> oh, I know it's just a makeup class, and then I think maybe schedule is not so good. Okay. So what I have for you here is is the idea is kind of nice in the sense that we already saw before that the capacitance only depends on the physical factors like the width, the, the, the separation, or maybe the distance or the radius of this and that. So it's more like the only thing that you're going to have to be able to change the capacitance is by changing the physical shape, okay? So without that, the, other, the only thing that we can do is changing, I said, changing the environment somehow, having your hands around, your fingertips around. What is the effect that has the result in the changing of the capacitance? This is what it is. The key factor is in this dude over here. Remember the epsilon here? What we had before was the epsilon naught. And it was just like, hey, that's the permittivity of free space. Every time we talk about this one, or we saw like k equal to one over four pi epsilon naught, that's for free space, so that's a vacuum. That's good. So here comes the question. If you have a charged particle, maybe positive charge over here, and then you are at the distance away from it, let's say point P at the distance R, so everyone knows we can calculate the electric field at point P by using one over four pi epsilon naught Q over R square, right? Now imagine that, hey, instead of having this in a vacuum, somehow I place this in some other material. So it, this is filled with something else, which is not a blank space anymore. What should be the electric field at point P now? It turns out it's very simple. I can just turn this into one over four pi epsilon over R square. Is it cool? Okay. okay. So it means all I need is just try to figure out what is the epsilon of this material. And I'm just using that instead of epsilon of the vacuum. So that means epsilon naught, you can think of it as just one epsilon, but it is an epsilon of a free space. So come back to our business over here. So you already saw from last time that you calculate the capacitance of this parallel plate capacitor. You use the Gauss's law followed by the definition of the potential difference. And then you just come up with the definition of the C, take the ratio between the charge and the difference of the potential, and then you're done. But along this calculation, you use epsilon naught all the time because the space around these charges are just a vacuum. 
So here comes the question. If you squeeze in something else in between, what should have the effect onto the capacitance? All right, and now you can guess what John, you just use epsilon then. <laughs> and that is right, that it is, what it is. But then now we want quantitative analysis of this one then, that what epsilon or what kind of property of this material will do to the capacitance itself, okay? So we kind of like, okay, we're not gonna just squeeze anything in between and it doesn't do anything with the capacitance C. We want to be able to do something useful with it. And the way, the way that we want the, I mean, the usefulness of this one is if we can enhance or if we can improve or increase the capacitance, that would be really nice because that means without changing the physical size, I still keep the capacitor to look and feel and everything exactly the same. I mean, it's the same width, same, same area, same separation, everything is the same. The only thing that is going to get changed is the space in between is going to be filled with something else. And if that something else allows the increase in the capacitance, that would be nice. That means using the same amount of space, I can increase the capacitance so many times. What kind of material is that? That material is called dielectric material. What is the dielectric material? It turns out the molecules of these material is made out of this kind of thing. All right, when you look at this cartoon version of this one is, you can guess, I think. When you look at this one, as you can see, it has the plurality on the molecules. One side is positive, the other one is negative. So this means the whole molecule is still neutral. It's still zero net charge. But the distribution of the charge on each molecules are not evenly distributed. So one example that you probably, I mean, have seen before is H2O. Yeah, water. And if you still recognize from maybe chemistry, the electronegativity of all the elements in the, ta in the element table, the oxygen has a higher electronegativity. So that means electrons tend to spend more time on oxygen than, in this case, the hydrogen atoms. So that means even though the oxygen, uh, the, the H2O, the water molecule are neutral, but in each individual molecules, the electron tend to spend more time around oxygen atoms. So that left space around hydrogen atoms more positive. So I can actually write, sort of like draw the cartoon or representation of this to be like, okay, it's like a molecule and then the bottom one is more positive and the upper one is more negative, something like that, right? So this cartoon version of this one is just representing a polar molecule, the molecule that has positive and negative end of the plurality. Cool? All right, but anyway, in general, these molecules just randomly oriented, so you don't feel anything, at all, uh, there's no net effect of anything whatsoever. But then things start to get very interesting if you apply the external field to it. So let's say you introduce the external field. What happened to these molecules? All right, so let's imagine, like, look at one of them. So I have now electric field pointing from left to right, right? Of course, what well, done, positive charge will move in the same direction as the field. Negative charge will try to go against the field. But even, I mean, all, I mean right now, they cannot just simply move because they are attached. It's just a one molecule. So at least in terms of the, the acting force, the positive ends of the molecule will feel like, hey, I'm going to get pushed by the field. Why the negative ends of this one will get sort of like pushed, but in the opposite direction. So the net effect on the molecule is like you get a rotation. Does that make sense? All right. So this is like a sort of like a, a pair of forces acting on a piece of object and then it would make a turn, make it move in the rotation of motion. So perfect. So what it does is having the external electric field apply onto this dielectric material, you can think of it like you have like a mini compass all around and this compass is not sort of aligned according to the magnetic field, but it's now aligned according to the electric field applied. Does that make sense? So that means once you apply the external fields to it, you get the alignment of these dielectric molecules. So the positive try to go along, 
the negative one tries to go against. Now, here's the fun thing that start to happen. Don't forget that these molecules must be like, you know, tons of these molecules, Avogadro number, like million, 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 right? So if you look at one end of this one that is positive, so it's, I mean, it's a high chance that adjacent molecule will be in the direction of, I mean, you are facing the negative ends of the adjacent molecules. Does that make sense? So if you look at the other side of this one, of course, it will probably be close to the negative ends of the adjacent molecules on and on and on. So that means as long as you are analyzing the internal portion of this dielectric material, in one particular space, the net charge probably will be zero all the time. You have million, million, million of this, right? The only place that won't get this kind of cancellation is the one that stay at the surface of this material. Look at the left. The left end of this one doesn't have anything to cancel to. There's no positive portion of the adjacent molecule to cancel with. Same thing with the right end of this dielectric molecule, um, dielectric material, the right surface will have positive ends sticking around without any negative ends of neighboring atoms to cancel with. See that? So what are you seeing? So the external field in our particular case of the capacitor came from that parallel plate. So now you have the external field pointing from left to right. So it's right here, this dude here. But then these fields induce, does that make sense? It induce. So it means you make the polar molecule to align, and those alignments get the internal portion charges to cancel, left with just the surface charges. And those surface charges, if you notice, hey, it's pointing in the opposite direction. It's pointing backwards, guys. Because the left end will have negative, 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 negative portion here. And you have positive, positive, positive on the right. Cool. So you have an induced electric field that is going against the external field. But of course, the strength of the induced field won't be as strong as the external field, of course. So that means what you get is the bottom one. That's the external field coming in. This is the induced one. So you are left with just a smaller electric field. Isn't that cool? Okay. Okay. And what does the electric field that is smaller do to the capacitance? Do you say? You just say, Dan, it doesn't sound good. Electric field is smaller, so it sounds bad. But no, it's not that bad. So still remember the definition of the C? Capacitance is just a ratio between the charge per unit potential difference, right? Then we still remember the definition of the V itself can be calculated from the field through the integral of the E dot Vs, correct? Is it that nice? Start to see something here. If you look at the E, what happened when E is getting smaller? So if this one gets smaller, that will render this one smaller as well because they go hand in hand. The smaller the E, the smaller the dV. But then the thing is, when you look up over here, Bajan, if this thing gets smaller, you will get bigger C. Isn't that nice? Okay. So that's what it is. So what you get from here is you get a larger capacitance by reducing the size of the electric field. And that's what we want. So the only thing that we want is just right, okay, squeeze some dielectric material in between. You already increase the size of the capacitance automatically, and we are done. Okay. Right? That change can be quantitatively calculated through one parameter that describes this dielectric property of this material called dielectric constant, guys. And we use kappa for that. I think, I mean, some, some textbook might use K, or I mean, but I think for us, we can use kappa. Okay, it's fine. Okay, so there is a dielectric constant that gives you the value of something that I'm going to explain. But at least that is the parameter that attached to the dielectric material. So this, 
will give you okay there's this table give you the idea of what will be the value of the dielectric constant but he comes to Ajahn okay now I have the dielectric constant but what does it do to our calculation all right so I'm showing you right now and this is we already gone through all the explanation all right so the rest now is going to be the easy part here we go remember the Gauss's law here okay the flux equal to the charge divided by epsilon naught right so what we are about to do here is I'm just going to substitute this with epsilon. That's it. So that means instead of the free space, if you want to do in any space, all you have to do is just substitute that with the epsilon and you are done. Just like what I just showed you with the Coulomb law. Just replace epsilon naught with the epsilon. But here comes the good news. It turns out the dielectric constant that we just introduced is being represented right here, guys. Can you see? Okay. So the epsilon of that material is just the kappa times the epsilon naught. So that means the way that we define the epsilon is simply just how many times of the value of the permittivity of that material relative to the permittivity of free space. And the multiple of that, that is the value of the dielectric constant. That's all. Okay. Okay. So that's how easy it is to use that dielectric constant now. So if you look at this table and now you look at this, well, John, air is like, okay, it's almost one because, yeah, for vacuum, kappa is unity. So air, we can treat it as vacuum. That is fine. But then what else you can have? Like, for example, you can look at the porous styrene. If you have 2.6 dielectric constant, that means you already enhance your the epsilon by 2.6 times. So that's it. So it's 2.6 epsilon naught. All right. Look at water. Huge because we already knew water molecule is pretty pretty polar. It's uh, super polar actually. So as you can see now, the strength of it is like 80. So that means if you put water in between, which you shouldn't put in between, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that would be bad. But anyway, the point is, if you have water in between, you can just have to uh, say that the epsilon is increased by 80 times relative to the epsilon naught. Okay? All right, cool. Oh, there is a chat here. Oh. oh, okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so you can catch up with the video. Yeah, I will post it on the on the YouTube. All right, it's pretty short. Okay, thank you. All right, so what we have over here is now you understand that once you know the dielectric constant of that material, just pop it up, uh, pop it in front of the epsilon naught and you get the epsilon for that material. How easy it is to do that. And as you can see now, you have a, like, a, like a ceramic and some exotic material that can have the kappa as big as like, you know, a couple of hundreds, a, a few, I mean, a few hundreds. Uh, value of it is go as big as like 300, 100, 200, or the that means you can enhance the epsilon by that much. When I say enhance the epsilon, what does it really do? <laughs> so, still remember the parallel plates capacitor when we were doing it last time? The C of that is epsilon naught A over D, right? Remember, we were discussing about the keyboard. And we saying that, hey, the only way that you can change the C is by either changing the size of the plates or changing the separation between the plates. But now you can see that in this expression, you have epsilon naught built in. So that's it. That means if you squeeze in the material that has the dielectric constant kappa, the only thing that you need to change is you just split that and change that into epsilon. And that's it. You're done. Oops, sorry. Epsilon, not not anymore. Epsilon over D. But we just said the epsilon is just kappa times the epsilon naught A over D. And then you see, Bajan, hey, epsilon naught A over D is just the original C, right? And that's what it is. You get the enhancement of the capacitance by kappa times. You are done. Okay. <laughs> Is that easy? So it means by squeezing in the dielectric constant, uh, dielectric material with the dielectric constant kappa, 
you increase your capacitance by that kappa time. Done. Okay, so now if you have the formula, and don't forget this is a question in the final exam for you to show that the capacitance of a cylindrical capacitor is given by this formula over here, right? So the formula for that is going to be 2 pi epsilon naught L over log B over A. All right, and you saw that. All right, there is an epsilon naught there because the space in between is just the vacuum. So what you can do is, well, John, I want to squeeze in the dielectric material in between, so I'm just going to squeeze in and insert something in there. And if I know that the material that I'm using over here is having the dielectric constant of kappa, you can just say the new value is just going to be 2 pi epsilon L over log B over A. See, everything else stays fixed because you haven't changed the physical sizing, physical dimensions are same. The only thing that's changed is just the environment. All right, that's it. But the epsilon is just kappa times the original epsilon naught. So you're just saying that you enhance the capacitance by kappa time and you are done. Okay. All right, so I hope this gives you a very nice conclusion about the dielectric material and dielectric constants and its consequence in improving or changing the capacitance of a capacitor without adjusting the physical dimensions of the capacitor itself. Sounds cool? No calculus, no nothing. It's just algebra, multiplication, that's all. All right. To see this one a little bit clearer, I have three exercises to show you, and that's it. We call it done for the whole course. Sounds like a good plan? Okay. Take a look at the first one. It's going to be an, an example of like plug and play, the easy one. You have a parallel plate air felt capacitor has a capacitance of 50 picofarad. So you will see that the farad unit is a huge unit for capacitance. So you have pico over here is 10 to the negative 12. All right. So part A, if each of its plates has an area of 0.25 square meter, what is the separation? So the first part is just applying the formula directly. So we already saw that the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor is epsilon naught A over D. All right, because you already given the capacitance value, so it's 50 times 10 to the negative 12. Very cool. Epsilon naught, you can look it up. That's no big deal. The area of the plate is given to be 0.25 square meter over D. So that's it. So from here, you should be able to calculate D using the calculator and you are done. Okay. All right. Now, part B. Well, hey, if the region between plates, between the plates is now filled with material having the dielectric constant of 5.6, what is the new capacitance? <laughs> well, John, yeah. Okay, let me write down the formula here. So what you have over here is instead of a free space, you have some material, and that material has the kappa given. So you just replace the epsilon with the kappa of the epsilon naught, and that's it. It's 5.6 of the original capacitance. So that's it. You can say it's just 5.6 times the 50 picofarads, and you are done. Okay. Cool. All right, so that's how easy it is to apply the dielectric constants whenever you have dielectric constant around charge distribution. Okay, you just replace epsilon naught with epsilon, and you're done. Try again. You have an air filled parallel, parallel plate, plate capacitor has a capacitance of 1.3 picofarad. Now the separation of the plate is double. Whoa. The wax is also inserted between them. The new capacitance is 2.6 picofarad. So you double the capacitance. Find the dielectric constants of the wax. All right, so this one we like. We have done a lot of this back in the day of thermodynamics studies. When you have two scenarios, two setup, two environments, you, know, you just want to compare them. You just write them down separately. So let me call this the first setup is an air fill. So it's an epsilon naught because it's the air. A, let me call A1 over separation one in case that you want to adjust the area surface and separation altogether. Yeah, that's fine. 
And then you compare this to the second case when you already change the environment to not the not, but just the epsilon. So that's it, all right? So it's gonna be epsilon of the wax. So that's what it is. And then you might have a new area, you might have a new separation, you just set it up like that. And then you just do the comparison, okay? Just take the ratio between the two, and then I'm just gonna pair the same type or the same parameters together in a pair and compare them one by one. So I can do the epsilon wax over epsilon naught, that's for the permittivity pair. And then you have A2 over A1, that is the area pair. And then you have D1 over D2, that is just the separation pair. Because this particular problem, you are not changing the surface area. So that was just disappear, Says stay the same. The epsilon of the wax is just the kappa of the wax multiplied by the epsilon naught. So as you can see, the epsilon naught eventually will disappear. Okay, and because you doubled the separation, so that means D2 is twice of the original D1, I mean the original separation. So the ratio on the back is 1 over 2. And that's it, guys. You are done. The K of the wax is going to be, oh, sorry, I forgot to substitute this. On the left, the new capacitance is 2.6 picofarad. The original is 1.3 picofarad. So the ratio on the left is going to be 2 right there. So I can say K wax is just 2 times 2, and it's 4, and we are done. Okay. Is it a nice? All right, so I hope you can see that knowing the dielectric constants, that's everything that you need, <laughs> I guess. All right, guys, last one, shall we? Woohoo! Woo! All right, so you have a coaxial cable used in a transmission line, has an inner radius of 0.1 and outer radius of 0.6, that's fine. So you just recognize that, okay, now we have a coaxial cable, so that will fall into a case of this cylindrical capacitor, okay? All right, coaxial stuff, so no big deal. So you say, calculate the capacitance per meter. All right, look at the formula for that. It's, don't forget, this is going to be the one that's going to get asked in the final exam that you need to show this. So you have the value of this. You just bring in the whole expression over there. So you get it's 2 pi. And now epsilon, it depends on what type of material you squeeze in between. And then you take the L over log B over A. Okay? That's pretty much like plug and play again in the dynamo. Yeah, I think that's what it is. They're asking for the capacitance per meter. Perfect. So that means I can just move L to the left-hand side. So what you're getting is going to be C over L. That's capacitance per meter. It's going to be 2 pi. Now you can take epsilon to be kappa of the epsilon naught. But then the kappa is just, you look it up in the table, it's just for polystyrene. And if you go back and take a look, oh, it's 2.6. So that means it's just going to be 2.6 times epsilon naught, 1 over log. Now, the outer radius is 0.6, inner radius is 0.1, so the ratio is going to be 6. And that's it, guys. All you need to do is just plug in the value of the epsilon naught, hit the calculators, and we are officially okay. done. Cool. <laughs> All right, so... That's it, guys. So I'm just going to draw the line here. This is the end of our course right here. And this is going to be the last topic that is going to get covered in our final exam. Okay? So that is it. I hope you learned something in this course. And I hope that don't hate physics too much. <laughs> All right. Okay, guys. Thank you for sticking around. And I, I, I'll, I'll see you again, of course, on... Uh, next Sunday, okay, for our final, maybe not face-to-face, -face, but at least uh, we're going to have to do final exam one more time before we sort of like stay apart. And uh, well, just say hi if you meet each other on campus next semester, maybe, okay, just around campus. I'm still around, I guess. All right, guys, so thank you so much, and okay. that's the one. Bye-bye. Take care. See ya.